Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, tonight I'm going to get right into the Word, and I believe that, that God is speaking something to this church, and I believe that God has a flow of teaching that, that He wants to give to us. And this morning, uh, we, we heard about the year of the shout. We heard about what happens when we shout, what it, what it seals a commitment in our church and our city, and, and we talked about those things, and it was exciting. And tonight, I, I've got a Word that, that not only builds on those principles, it also stands alone, and so you're going to be encouraged tonight in your walk, encouraged to shout and to do what God has called you to do. So let's prepare our hearts to hear from the Lord. It's not about hearing from me, not about hearing from a man or woman, from the young or the old. It's about hearing from God. So let's prepare our hearts. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're so grateful that we can come into an excited, joyous house of God where we can praise you on a Sunday night. Lord, where many churches have closed their doors or have done other things, God, it's just so great that this house of God is open Lights on, encouragement loud, and God just shouting your fame, God. Lord, we, we just are honored and privileged that you would allow us the privilege of being who we are, living where we do, in the time that we do, God, so that we can openly and freely come into a house of God, lift our hands and worship you, give a shout and praise you. God, we do. We thank you. Lord, tonight, we ask that as we open up your word, you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide, instruct us in your ways, correct us, and show us what it is that you have for each and every one of our individual lives. Give us the vision and the direction that we need, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. And God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. God, we would ask it also for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. We love them, Lord, and we bless them this night. Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Grab your Bible, and if you want to open it up to the book of Acts, we're going to be a little bit in the book of Acts and, and some other places tonight. And, and I've entitled the message, kind of a funny little title. It's called Radical, Fanatical, or Nuts. How's that for a title? Radical, Fanatical, or Nuts. In order to illustrate this, I thought that I would uh, uh, play a little video for you, and, and if you want, just direct your attention to the overhead screens, and the video department is going to play a video, but just check it out with these words in mind. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. But they had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. Pretty amazing. Puts it into perspective for you and I. The world goes all out for their own entertainment. They go all out for their accomplishments, build themselves shrines. Anything that interests them, they, they, they go completely crazy over. Uh, I mean, you think about it, uh, you take things like food. You know, that's something that we all encounter on a daily basis. And now it's no longer food. It's the food challenge. It's the best and the biggest and the brightest and the most wonderful. And, and there's a series and there's the next star and the next person that's going to rise. All, all over food. And yet... We can look at other things. They tell the story. 
They, they, they have accolades. They, they write books. Somebody dies that created something, an inventor or something like that. Now they've got the story, and the next thing you know, they've got the movie, and the next thing you know, they've got the miniseries, and, and they've got the t-shirts and the buttons and all this kind of stuff, websites, blogs. Anymore, you can't even get real news. My wife and I were watching the news in the morning the other day, and we were trying to find out what's really going on in the world. You know, what's happening? Is there, is there anything? I mean, there, there's been some major world events lately, some major things going on. There's been some conflicts, wars. There's been tsunamis. There's been earthquakes. We're trying to find out and follow up what's going on, and all we can find out about is entertainment. Yeah. And we're sitting there thinking, well, I don't care. What, what is this? Who, who, is, who is this person even? What makes them so special that they're going to spend 15 minutes on this channel talking about their next movie or their next television show when there's real things going on in the world, there's real hurt going on in the world, there's real pain, there's real trials, there's real things happening that are important that we need to know about. And yet the world is lifting up their idols. When we come to Jesus, we become a Christian, we start to realize that Jesus isn't passive. Jesus isn't somebody who wants us to just live a quiet life where we do nothing. Jesus demands no less than all. Jesus wants us to tell his story. He wants us to shout his fame. He gave all, therefore he demands and desires all from us. I like how our pastor says it during the altar call. He says, you might say that's radical, fanatical Christianity. But in the Bible, we can't find anything other than radical Christianity because it requires all of our heart and all of our life and commitment. Tonight, what does it mean for Christians to be radical fanatical? See, when you heard that title tonight, maybe even when you saw the video, you thought radical fanatical, no way, that's not for me. That's not something I want to be. I don't want to look crazy. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to be nuts. But remember, the title of the message was not don't be radical fanatical. No, it was radical fanatical or nuts. Because as Christians, you'll see this tonight from the Word of God and by defining what it means that God really wants us to be radical. God really wants us to be fanatics for His name. And as we go through tonight, what does it mean for Christians to be radical fanatical? If we're going to go out to the Inland Empire and we're going to shout something to them, we better be shouting the right thing and we better be shouting it the right way. Because there's been people who have shouted at me and sometimes I've listened and said, man, they're shouting. They've got, they've got to go. That's what I'm talking about. In fact, when I came to this church for the very first time, over a decade ago, I remember walking in the doors. I remember hearing the message. I remember the word of God. I remember the power of God. I remember seeing people drawn to the altar. And I remember saying that I heard something that I hadn't heard before. I, 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 I just got to get a hold of that. I got to get more of that. And it drew me in. But there's been other times where people have been shouting things that has pushed me away. In fact, one of my friends was telling me that when they were in college up here at at Cal State San Bernardino, there was a person that was standing up on top of one of the concrete little uh, areas that was a planter or something like that, and they were shouting, and they were literally preaching their false doctrine to the people passing by, and they said it was so detestable to them, so, so abrasive to them that they just had to get away. They couldn't stand it anymore. You and I, we, we've got to shout something. We've got to make sure that, number one, we're shouting the right thing. Number two, that we're shouting the right way. What does it mean for Christians to be radical, fanatical? First thing it means is radical change. Radical change. If we're going to be radical, fanatical Christians, it's got to be different. And it's got to be radically different. Now, what does that mean, radical? Well, let's define radical for a second. Radical means considerable departure from the usual or traditional. Think about that for a second. Considerable departure from the usual or traditional. We've been having church in America for over 200 years. And there is a order of worship. Maybe you've heard that term, maybe you haven't. There's, there's things that have gone on for centuries and they've continued to go on. Why? Because that's how we've always done it. 
But God has not called us to do things just because that's the way we've always done it. No, he's caused us to be different. We are a peculiar people. We are called out from amongst the nations. We are called to be his chosen people. We are called to be what the Bible calls peculiar, radically different, radically changing, and not just accepting the norm, going beyond and departing from the usual or the traditional. Drove me crazy. I, I went to a Bible college that was in the Midwest, and it drove me crazy because on Sunday morning, everything was, was pretty, pretty quiet. Everything was pretty sparse. Why? Because Bible Belt, right? Everybody went to church. So Sunday morning, we went to church, and there we were in church. Everybody was dressed to the hill. You know, they had their Sunday best on. They, they, they were doing their thing in church. And then my wife worked at the uh, customer service counter, the store that we both were, were able to work at together. It was a blessing to work together. But she worked at the customer service counter. And I remember after church, we would go to, go to work. We got, you know, Sunday morning, we were off, so we would work the later shift on Sunday afternoon into the evening. And there I would see from where I was at, I was a cashier at one point, and I could see the customer service desk, and I could see people in their Sunday best chewing her out. Drove me crazy. Why? Because the people in the Sunday best and the people in their Sunday worst were no different than one another. There was no change. God has called us as Christians not to go to church on Sunday morning and then act like the world the rest of the week. No, God has called us to be radically different in our lifestyle, in our expressions, in everything that we say and do from the world. What does radical mean? Considerable departure from the usual or traditional. It also means extreme. Tending or disposed to make drastic changes in existing views, habits, and conditions. That, that's powerful for you and I to understand that as Christians, if we're going to be radical, fanatical Christians, we've got to bring a radical change. That when we take a look at San Bernardino, when we take a look at the surrounding areas, that there is an existing view. The view is this place is the armpit. The view is this place is worthless. It's going down the toilet. It's already down, down the drain. This, it's always been this way, and the connotation is it always will be that way. But I'm here to tell you that as Christians, if we're going to be radical, fanatical, we've got to radically change that view. We've got to start speaking life into our city. This is a desirable place. This city will call on the name of the Lord. This city has revival coming to it. This city will be a desirable place for people to move. Businesses will come in in Jesus' name. The economy will be on an upswing and not on a downturn. The 46% of the people that are on some form of social welfare will get on their feet. They'll get Jesus and they'll get prosperous and they will be a blessing to others. But it's going to take a radical people bringing a radical change, starting to change that view. Habits, habits. Some people are habitual liars. Some people are habitual in their drug use. Some people are habitual. Why? Because we were raised that way. Mom did it that way. Dad did it that way. My uncle did it that way. My grandma and grandpa who raised me did it that way. But it's time to be radical and it's time to come against those things that are holding us back and holding us down. We've got to bring drastic change to the views, to the habits, and finally to the conditions. You know, the Bible says that you and I are to be the restorer of the breach. We are to be the ones who, who the world says can fix anything. My goodness, God has called us to be a people that go out and bring radical change. Why? Because we've got the love of Jesus. Why? Because we've got the resources of heaven. Why? Because we have the love of the Father flowing in and through us, and we've got the Spirit of grace empowering us to do the work. We've got a radical God. Radically different. Brings radical change. When God gets on the scene, things don't stay the same. The rules don't apply, and now no longer will it be the same. No, it is forever changed. And that God that I'm talking about lives on the inside of you and lives on the inside of me. So let me ask you, church, what is stopping us from giving a shout and bringing radical change to this city? It's time. It's time for you and I to stand up and be the church of God and bring radical change. I love how the Bible records the missionary journeys in the, in the early church and the people that went out and brought this radical change. Paul and Silas traveling, witnessing, went to a place called Thessalonica in Acts chapter number 17. 
There in Thessalonica, they did what they normally do. They went to the synagogue and they started to sit down, started to teach and preach, you know, started to reason with the people. And, and, and the Bible records that multitudes were brought to Jesus. Radical change. Here's a place that worshipped idols. Here's a place that had a Jewish synagogue that just had always done their thing. They were caught in their religion, caught in their legalism. But multitudes were brought to the Lord. They were persuaded. The Bible said even notable women. I mean, it records. Notable women, what? People of influence. It brought a real change to Thessalonica. But the people that weren't persuaded... The people that were caught up in their religion, the people that were caught up in their own ways, in their own thing, and they got mad. They didn't get saved, and all of a sudden the Bible records that they got envious. And now they go to find Paul and Silas, and they go to a man by the name of Jason's house. And they're searching Jason's house, and they don't find him there. So they drag Jason out, and they accuse these men of something. Now, it's very interesting for you and I to understand what they accuse them of. Acts chapter 17, verse number 6. Let's read it together. It says, but when they did not find them, speaking of Paul and Silas, they, the group of people that were not persuaded, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out. Now listen to what they accuse them of. This is what they're crying out to the rulers of the city. Crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What an accusation. What, what a charge against the people of God. These who have, what, turned the world upside down. What does that mean? That means it was radically different than it was before. And they weren't mad that they turned the world upside down. No, they were mad that they came here too. They turned my world upside down. I had all these people coming to church, and now all of a sudden they want to follow Jesus. What's that all about? I, I had all this prestige and this power and this money, and now they've turned that upside down. It's radically different. And they couldn't handle it anymore. Church, when we come on the scene, it should be said of us that things have changed so much that the world has been turned upside down. San Bernardino has been turned upside down. Rialto has been turned upside down. Colton has been turned upside down. Highland has been turned upside down. Come on, somebody. Redlands has been turned upside down. Yukaipa has been turned upside down. The Inland Empire has been turned upside down. Radically different because the church stood up and brought a radical change. What does it mean for Christians to be radical Fanatical. Number one is radical change. Number two is fanatical expressions. Not only radical change, but fanatical expressions. Once again, we've got to find out what this word means. See, we, we look at something like fanatical, and, and when you hear people talking about fanatics, we think of those images we just saw in the video right before. We think about, you know, people painting their bodies and the letters and, and, and dancing in the snow with their, nothing but their pants on, you know, that sort of a thing. And they're just out there, and they're wild, and they're crazy, and they're nuts. But fanatical does not mean nuts. No, fanatical means excessive enthusiasm and intense devotion. I, I can't think of a better place to be fanatical than in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. My goodness, that was the weakest couple of claps I've ever heard. Maybe I should bring the band up again and we can sing. No, listen, we got to be taught this stuff because otherwise we'll hear radical fanatical and we'll think, that's not me, I don't want to be that, I can't be that, I can't. No, listen, what is it? Excessive enthusiasm. I love what Jim Elliott said. Lord, light these idle sticks of mine that I may burn for you. Famous evangelist said that all he wanted to do was just be lit on fire so that other people could come and watch him burn. What does that mean? That means that it only takes a spark, church, to start a whole forest fire. I believe that God is kindling something here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And it starts with you and I giving a shout out. It starts with you and I finding out what radical change is. It starts with you and I getting fanatical about the things of God where it's not just something we do on Sunday. We don't just come Sunday night because we were told to. No. Why? Because now all of a sudden we've got excessive enthusiasm. That's why this church is the noisy church. 
That's why we're going to be in the noisy section of heaven when we get there. Why? Because it's excessive. Let me ask you something. The Bible says that Jesus saves to the uttermost. That means that there is nothing that you could do that's beyond the extent of his reach to the uttermost. Some preachers have added to the gutter most. Why? Because you think about the people that got saved in the Bible. You had unruly, crude fishermen. You had murderers. You had sorcerers. I mean, you had all kinds of people that came to the Lord that are recorded in the Bible. God used mightily people who were murderers, people who were sons of prostitutes and prostitutes themselves. Hello. So if God can do all that, if God can go the extra mile, if God can lay down his life when he didn't have to, he could have let us go to hell. But he didn't. He was excessive. Don't you think that if he could pour all that out on you and I, plus his love, plus his grace, plus his blessings, plus his provision, plus oh, just abundance. If God can do all that for you and I, don't you think that he's worthy of some excessive enthusiasm about the things of God? Hallelujah. It's a much better clap and intense devotion. What does that mean? That means that I'm on the Lord's side. That means you're not going to shake me off this tree. That means that I am holding on to Jesus and, and, and nothing's going to take me out of his grip. Why? Because he's got his grip on me. But I'm not just going to sit back and, and hope that that's... No, I'm holding on to Jesus too. He's wrapped around me, but I'm wrapped around him. He, I've got all of him and now I'm giving him all of me. Holding nothing back from my Lord. Intense devotion. When I, when I lived in Tulsa in the Midwest there, uh, I've told this before, but I mean, the people were, were, were what I would say fanatical. They would paint their houses the colors of the football team that they liked. Now think about it for a second. Tulsa does not have a pro team. So, I mean, I know Green Bay and you know, all the yellow and green and all that kind of stuff and the cheese heads up there, but this is college football, Right? And you were either orange and black, or you were red and white. That was OU or OSU, okay? And they would paint their houses the color. We got a person in our neighborhood here in California that has a bright orange Oregon State color car. And my wife and I drive by and marvel that anybody would want a car that color. But they do. Why? Because they're fanatical. There are people who will paint their bodies and stand out in the snow in support of their team. Why? Because they're excessive in their enthusiasm and they are completely devoted. Devoted to their own hurt. You and I, can't we be excessive in our enthusiasm for Jesus? Can't we tell somebody about Jesus? Can't, can't we invite someone to church? Can't we spread the good news? Can't we say what the Lord has done in our life? Can't we be the walking billboard for Jesus Christ? It'd be a tragedy if all we did was put billboards up on the freeways and you were never the walking billboard for Jesus Christ. See, that's what this is really all about. The Bible says that we are the letter and that written on our heart is the story and that we are open for all men to read. See, people are watching your life. Maybe you didn't think it. Maybe you didn't know it. Maybe you don't agree or don't think so, but, but, but take a look. Tomorrow morning when you go to work, see who's watching. How about this? Be an excessive, enthusiastic, completely devoted person. Bring your Bible and, and, and lay it down. Now, don't read on the job or anything like that. You've got to work on the job. Just have it sitting there by you. And watch how many people notice what just took place. How many people are going to peer over your shoulder and say, what's that? What are you doing? Don't preach at me. And you're like, what? I didn't say nothing, right? Had one guy ask me, you know, do, I, I, I put up a, a, a picture of Jesus in my cube. You know, it was just a little painting that I had. And I put it up in my, my cubicle. Should I take it down? And I said, well, you know, have they told you to take it down? He said, no. I said, well, it's fine, you know. He said, what if they tell me to take it down? Should I take it down? I said, yeah, take it down. But he says, well, wait a second, wait a second. Well, you know, do, should I lose my job over it? Or should I? And I said, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. 
That's not what this is about. What this is about is you being a witness for Jesus Christ. You work harder than everybody else. You, you work longer than everybody else. You be the best employee. You, you make your boss look good. You take care of the needs there. You do everything you can, and then when they look at your life, they'll see more Jesus than looking at that picture. That's what this is about. For Christians to be radical, fanatical, we've got to bring radical change and fanatical express it, expressions. Enthusiasm is catchy. Enthusiasm is catchy. If you've ever been around a person that's smiling, you ever been around somebody that's just smiling? How about this? You've been driving on the freeway, having a bad day, and you look over and somebody's like this in the car, right? They're, they're driving and they're like this. <laughs> I pulled up next to a guy at the, at the stoplight the other day, and he was, he was doing this number, right? If this was the dashboard, and this was the steering wheel, he was like this. You know, and he was even getting the ugly face in there a little bit while he was jamming. And I don't know what he was jamming on, but man, he, he was in the zone. He was probably in Madison Square Garden, just on the drums right then, man. And I almost felt bad when the light turned green, but I noticed he didn't even stop. He just kind of zipped around the corner, still drumming. Now, now, what happens when you see that? All of a sudden, you, you forgot about what you were so mad about. All of a sudden, you've got a smile, and you don't even know why. Why am I smiling? I don't have anything to smile about. But enthusiasm is catchy. Fanaticism is catchy. That's why those guys that paint their bodies and stuff get put on the jumbotron. Why? Because they want the rest of the people in that stadium to get going. Take a look at these crazies. Take a look at what's going on over here. They painted their bodies, and they're in the middle of the snow. And all of a sudden, everybody, <sighs> Why? Because enthusiasm is catchy. Listen, church, if we are the light of the world, then we need to start shining our light. If the Lord has lit us on fire with the fire of the Spirit, it's time to let the area around us catch fire from our heat. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turn me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I love how the Apostle Paul starts to defend his ministry and starts to open up about what's really going on in his life. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. He starts to talk about what he's done. And you want to talk about a religious fanatic. You want to talk about somebody intensely devoted. You want to talk about somebody who, who, who is, is just excessive in their enthusiasm, even in the face of opposition. See, sometimes we don't think about this, but if you start being the Christian that God has wanted you to be, there's going to be some people that say, sit down and be quiet. There's going to be some people that say, no, don't you preach at me. That's not allowed. There's going to be some people that start scheming against you, trying to find out how they can get you quiet. We start to give a shout the way God wants us to give a shout. It's going to stir up a hornet's nest, and there's going to be people who don't like it. Why? Because it's radical change. That's not the norm. That's, that's not the way it's been. You turned everything upside down. No, we turned it right side up. It was upside down. You had it all messed up. We just righted it. And so now this is the way it's going to be. There's going to be people mad that we changed something. And here's the Apostle Paul talking about what happened in his life when he brought real change, radical change, and fanatical expressions through his life in the face of opposition. Verse 23, he's defending himself. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. And he says, I am more. See, this is a foolish expression, and he knows it, and he's, he's saying, listen, if we're going to talk about this, if we're going to talk about fanatics, intense devotion, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now listen to the words he uses to describe this. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. That's the sea. Verse 26, in journeys, often. In perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. My goodness, what is going on? This guy is a fanatic. Nothing is going to get him 
off of his Jesus. Nothing's going to distract him. Nothing's going to deter him. You cannot hold him back. You cannot put him down. He will not quit. He's not going to stop. Why? Because he's a fanatic. He met up with Jesus, and his life was radically changed, and now fanatical expressions are coming out of his life. Now, if we're doing what we should do as Christians and become radical fanatical, the world's going to see us as something other than radical, radical fanatical. They're going to see us as nuts. Now, remember, we, we started this by saying radical fanatical or nuts. Now, I tried to find out where the Word of God gave me permission to be nuts. I did. And it doesn't. The Word of God gives me permission to be radical fanatical. If you're going to be crazy, you're going to have to be crazy for Jesus. If you're going to be nuts, you've got to be nuts for Jesus, but you can't just be nuts. Some of you guys are staring at me kind of funny. A little nuts. But if we're going to ask ourselves, what does it mean for Christians to be radical, fanatical? It means not nuts. It'd be easy for us to equate radical fanatical with nuts, but this isn't so. It'd be easy for us to say, man, that is excessive. That, that, that's, that's beyond the norm. That's changing views and changing, I mean, the status quo has just been blown out of the water. That's fanatical expressions. That, that's, that's just insane devotion. I, I just, you don't see that. That's nuts. But God says that's not nuts. That's the norm for Christians. That's what we should be as Christians. See, if we're going to take a look at what it means to be radical, fanatical Christians, it means we're not nuts. Now let's take a look at a definition of nuts. And I'm not talking about the type that you eat or the type that you screw onto a bolt. No, nuts meaning crazy, meaning insane, meaning out of a sound state of mind. God has never called us to be out of our sound state of mind. That's why the people that say, oh, I can love Jesus and do my drugs at the same time, no, you're nuts. <laughs> you're out of your mind when you do those things. And God does not allow that. Thank you for that one clap. People see Christians as nuts. And I can understand why. It's different. It's not what they would see as the norm. But when you take a look at that video that we looked at, that seems a little nuts. Seems a bit crazy. Why would you pour money and time and effort and energy into something that's an hour, two hours, four hours, six? I mean, it's fun. It's memories. I understand that. It's great. But not at the expense of my life with Jesus. Not at the expense of souls that could have been saved. Not at the expense. Now, listen, if you're having fun with your kids, cool, do that stuff. Have fun. I'm not downing any of that. I'm not saying that that's, that's, you can't paint your face. You can't go have fun at a game. You can't buy a hat. No, please do that. Have fun. Go out there and do that. But listen, while you're doing that, remember to be a radical, fanatical Christian. While you're doing that, remember not to be nuts. Remember a, a kid in one of the youth groups I, I was ministering at one time, uh, he, he came in and, and he, he was telling us about his friend that he brought to church. And he said that he had been inviting his friend to church and inviting his friend to church and inviting his friend to church and his friend never came. And he, and he kept after him. He was persistent. He just went after this guy and said, you've got to come to my, come on, we have so much fun. You need to come. You need to come. You need to come. Come on, ask your mom. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And after a while, the kid finally gave in and said, okay, I'll come to your church, you know, just stop bugging me. And, and so he came and he had a great time. Really enjoyed himself in church and, and said, man, I, I'm going to come back here. And we were, you know, looking at this kid like, why are you sharing this with us? And he said, well, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because you should have heard what he said after he told us he had a good time. He said, the reason why it took him so long to come to church was because he thought at church that we dressed up in white robes and danced in a circle. <laughs> People think we're nuts. People don't know what goes on in church. And that's why you have to go, you have to bring the change, and you have to be a fanatic about this thing, intensely devoted and, and, and just excessively enthusiastic about it because people have all sorts of concepts about what church is. Remember, the, our society around us ha, has probably attended churches that aren't like your church. They, they probably 
been introduced to a Jesus that is not like the Jesus that we read in the Bible. It's sad, but it's true. There are movies on television that depict Jesus as a fornicator. There's movies that depict Jesus as a schemer, as just a philosopher, as just another good figure in history. But that's not the Jesus that I see in the Bible. No, Jesus makes some great claims. And the claims that Jesus made, people thought he was nuts. And yet, when I take a look at the life of Jesus, and I take a look at the impact that he had, and I take a look at the accounts and, and what's taken place, and then I take a look at my own life, and what God has done in my life by following Jesus, I know that Jesus was not nuts. I know that Jesus was my Lord and my Savior, and he's worth me being a radical and a fanatical. I love looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul's on his way to Rome, and he wants to testify in Rome. He's brought before the rulers of his day. He's kind of at a halfway point, and they're, they're deciding what to do with him. One of the ruler's name is Felix, and, and the other one is King Agrippa. King Agrippa and his wife, they're there. They're listening to Paul. If you want to turn with me to the Acts, uh, the 26th chapter, kind of towards the end of the book of Acts, the 26th chapter of Acts, Paul is defending himself talking about his life and, and sharing what, what took place in his life. He's, he's basically witnessing. He's testifying of the grace of God in his life and what God had did and how God intervened and, and how he got a hold of Jesus. And after he had that, that, that encounter with Jesus, his life was radically changed and now he was intensely devoted and expressing it in his life. Acts chapter number 26, starting in verse number 22, says these words. It says, this is Paul speaking. He says, therefore, having... Obtained help from God. To this day I stand witnessing, both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Now stop right there for a second. Hold on, hold on. Do you realize what Paul just said? He basically said, listen guys, I'm not nuts. Why? Because I'm not the only one who said, I'm not saying anything new. I'm just saying what the prophets said and what Moses said would happen. I, I'm not preaching my own gospel. I'm not creating new doctrines, new philosophies, new teachings. I'm just lining up with what we already knew to be true from the Bible. I'm not nuts. I just realize the truth. Verse number 23, look at what he says. That the Christ would suffer. That he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. That's the gospel message. That, that's just what we preach, that Jesus Christ came, he died, he was raised from the dead, and now there's no distinction. Everybody can come to Jesus. Everyone. You want to come to Jesus? Come on. You want to come to Jesus? Come on. You can, it doesn't matter if you're small, doesn't matter if you're great, doesn't matter if you're Jew, doesn't matter if you're Gentile, male, female, doesn't matter. Come to Jesus. That's not nuts, guys. That's basic Christianity 101. And yet when we get told to go and witness, and when we get, oh, that's radical, that's fanatical. Yes, it is, but it's not nuts. That's the norm for Christians. Now look at verse number 24. Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. What's another word for mad? Nuts. Am I right? Verse 25, but he said, I am not mad, not out of my mind. I'm still of a sound mind. I'm not crazy. I'm not foolish. No. He said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. See, sometimes people think that in order to become a Christian, you have to check your brains at the door of the church and come in and be brain dead, brainwashed. You, you, you can't have any sort of rational thought or reason to you. No, no, listen, we know the answers. When you take a look at science and science starts proving stuff, you say, my goodness, my God is big. Oh, my word. Wow, God did that? God can create the universe so vast and so big and so bright and so expansive, but also he can come to the very smallest part of my being and, and, and he can make the atom and, and the parts that make up the atom. I mean, come on. That's an amazing thing. We speak the words of truth 
and reason. We're not nuts. Never been called to be nuts. No, we've been called to be sound mind. We've been called to be reasonable. We have been called to be radical, bringing that change. And also fanatical, excessively enthusiastic and intensely devoted. Tonight, what does it mean for Christians to be radical, fanatical? A couple things that we learned. Number one, we learned that if we're going to be Christians who are radical, fanatical, number one, we learned that we've got to bring radical change. We cannot accept things to be the way that they've always been, and that's just how we do it. No, we've got to bring a, a considerable departure from the usual, traditional ways. We've got to be extreme, tending to be drastic changes in existing views, habits, and conditions. What does it mean? For Christians to be radical, fanatical. Number two, fanatical expressions. That we are to be excessive in our enthusiasm and intense in our devotion. Finally, third thing that we learned tonight. What does it mean for Christians to be radical, fanatical? Not nuts. You will push more people away by being nuts than you will by bringing people by being radical, fanatical. Come on, if you got something from the word of the Lord today, give him a great big praise. Well, before we go any further, I just want to make sure that all of you guys are right with God before you leave this place. We've had a great time in church. Maybe you didn't realize what happened right before your eyes, but we came in, we, we worshiped, we praised, felt the presence of God and, and the joy of our Lord tonight. Smiles on our faces, singing and dancing before the Lord. Heard a great word. That was, that was not my words. That was the word of God that you heard. My goodness. Maybe you didn't realize, but at the offering... There was even some things that happened. People gave money that's going to literally pay the bills of this place, reach out to the community. That just, just tonight from this offering, it's going to feed people. It's going to reach people around the world in our missions programs. Sometimes we don't realize what's going on right before our very eyes. And it'd be a tragedy for us to come into the house of God, have this great experience, walk out of this place tonight, sit in our car, turn the car on, and what if your heart stopped and you died and your heart wasn't right with God. Well, here's what happens. You'd go to hell. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Come on, let's not play games tonight. I want to make sure that if you left this place and it was your last night here on the earth, that if you died, you wouldn't end up in hell. I want to make sure that you'd end up in heaven. Love you enough and honor you enough and respect you enough to tell you the truth. Now, sometimes people hear that and they say, hey, pastor, I appreciate what you're trying to do. You get there your way, I'll get there my way. We'll all end up in the same place. Really? Because that doesn't work in the natural. Not all roads lead to the moon. So what makes us think that all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Not all roads lead to heaven. You can't just get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So it's God's heaven. We've got to get there. God's way. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news for me, Pastor, because I, I've been a really good person. You know, I used to be bad, but I changed my behavior. I've been really good, haven't done a lot of bad stuff in my lifetime. Uh, I gave money to charities, helped people out. You know, I've been working on my resume before I go to be with G Jesus. I, I've been really good, doing a lot of good things, volunteering and, and helping out, giving toys at Christmas to kids that wouldn't have had them otherwise. That's great. Glad you're doing those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible where, where you can be good enough to get into heaven? Where's the grading scale that shows you how good you have to be? Where, where's the curve that you have to be above in order to get into heaven? How good do you have to be to get to heaven? Listen, you're not going to get there just by being good. Because the standard is perfection, and the only one who's perfect, his name is Jesus. If you think that you're going to get to heaven just by being good, come on, let's love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, I was raised in church. Parents took me to church and called me a Christian. Had me baptized or christened as a child hung a cross or maybe a St. Christopher around your neck, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class, and born in America. We're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. Right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were raised in church, parents call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible it says America is a Christian nation, and if you're born in America, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. 
And again, nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, and denying hell. Come on. Listen up. You need to hear this. Some of you might be thinking, well, not only was I a child did I go to church, but here I am in church tonight. I'm sitting in, right here in front of you. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight. But show that to me in the Bible where church attendance is what God counts in order for you to get in heaven. That you sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Any more than you can sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. It doesn't work. So you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, ah, well, yeah, I understand that. But you know what? Uh, my last church, I got involved. I helped out sang in the choir, taught in the Bible classes, carried the pastor's Bible and made decisions in that church. In fact, people thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great, wonderful, glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Could you show that to me in the Bible where it says your church attendance, you help out, sing in the choir, teach in the Bible classes, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader that that gets you into heaven. It's not there, nowhere. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see God is looking for a membership card to a church when you enter the gates. It simply doesn't work like that. And come on tonight, let's not play games. Let's love you and respect you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, well, okay, pastor, I understand all that. But somebody tr told me that if I knew God, that that makes me a Christian headed for heaven. I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. I know about, uh, uh, you know, Christmas and, and, and sing the songs every year of my life. And I could quote scriptures to you. I, 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 you know, I could tell you stories out of the Old and New Testament. I know God. Therefore, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. But the problem with that is, have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible says the devil himself can quote scriptures, knows who Jesus is. That doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell. So everybody look up at me for a second. That means that it's not about what you have in your head that counts. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that's what gets you into heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. It's always been about your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Jesus said these words. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? He says he wants to find you hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Well, what's lukewarm mean? Well, it's a little in and a little out. It's a little up and a little down. It's a little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your heart and your life uh, that I just described not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. God is looking for your heart. Jesus described it like this. He said, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made that out to be crazy, nuts, like we talked about, but this is not about what society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's a radical change that in turn your heart becomes intensely devoted to and expresses itself. Tonight, will you give Him all of your heart? Will you give Him all of your life? Because if you haven't yet, then hey, come on. I want to give you an opportunity to do so tonight. I want to make sure that if you left this place and died, that you would go to heaven and not hell. Here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I, when I say the word three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang. Now, when you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven. And denying hell, I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm, you might be. Get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a second. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, tonight. 
Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being in hell. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Tonight, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. Just that simple. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed in this safe and friendly church service. People around you, they're excited for you. They want you to do this. There's no judgment, no criticism. No one's condemning you. We're, we're happy for you. You can do that tonight in this safe and friendly place. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a fresh start with God tonight. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer of the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher right afterwards you're coming to the church service. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one right there. There's two, three, four. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Four. Uh, is, that, is that a hand being raised there? She's got to do it herself. You can't do it for her. Okay. Anybody else real quick? We've got four wise people already. Anybody else real quick? You need to give God all your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? I just want to give you more. Hey, don't you just know that if there's four, there's number five just sitting there wondering if they should. You should. Come on, I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Real, gotcha, number five, thank you. Anybody else real quick? Just want to give you that opportunity. Real quick, real quick. You want to give God all your heart? You want to give God all your life? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a praise for five wise people tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all five of you, if you're number six, number seven, number eight, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, God just called you out. It's not too late for you. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front. Why? Because we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on, just make your way to the front. You come. Cause Lord, I give you my heart. I They're give coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your I'll moment of salvation. Live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make it right to the front right now. Lord, have your way. All right, all right. Hey, everybody. So glad that you guys came forward tonight, giving God all of your heart and all of your life. It's the best decision of your entire life. Now, I know we talked about being radical. It's going to be a, a, a different thing for you. It's going to be a change in your life, okay? Now, you're, you're going to wake up tomorrow and look the same, smell the same, but hey, you're different on the inside, okay? I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. We're not nuts. No white robes, no dancing in circles, none of that stuff, okay? Just, he's simply going to pray with you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to get strong and find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. What is that? Well, that's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works. It's simple. It's free. Now listen, you said... Not me, you said you're gonna give God all your heart. You said you're gonna give God all of your life. An SPT or a spiritual personal trainer is that friend in church who will help you to do just that, to follow up that commitment with your heart and your life. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, just give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Amen.